Hello guys, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. What we did last class? I think uh, we did with uh, Werner's coordination theory, right? Yes, sir. We wrote drawbacks of Werner's theory. That was the last thing. Okay. So primary, secondary valency we have discussed. We also discussed the number of ionizable ions. Okay. So, um, right. So we have few drawbacks in Werner's coordination theory. That's why we require another kind of, you know, uh, theory for bonding in coordination compound. Right. And then we got valence bond theory. This valence bond theory is very much similar that we have done in um, in chemical bonding, if you remember. Okay. All those hybridization and all we'll discuss it here. So the next theory is valence bond theory. One second just to give me. Um, Okay, so Werner coordination theory, just one question we'll see, and then we'll move on to the next theory in coordination compound, that is valence bond theory, okay? So look at this question. You are on mute. Yes, so formula and moles of AgCl precipitate per mole of the compound with excess AgNO3, right? So formula is given here. The first one is PdCl2 dot 4NH3 NiCl2 dot 6H2O PdCl4 dot 2HCl COCl3 dot 4NH3 PtCl2 dot 2NH3. These are the molecules given. Okay. 
great to the primary and secondary valency and what is the formula of this molecule because there is nothing like you know it is not written in a square bracket or something like that so how many ligands are present in the complex part that you need to find out plus the primary and secondary valency for all these compounds you need to find out if the number of moles of agcl precipitated for per moles of this is 2 for the first one then 2 then 0 then 1 and then 0 this is the data given find out primary valency secondary valency and the formula One second, guys.
okay so the first one yeah so you see the number of moles of agcl precipitate right so agcl that precipitate it depends upon the number of ionizable chlorine atom there right so moles of agcl precipitate is 2 it means there are two chlorine atom which is present outside the complex the coordination complex right hence the formula for the first one if you write down the formula should be this palladium is the metal nh3 4 and then cl2 outside okay so from here if you find out the primary valency what is the primary valency here the primary valency is 2 the oxidation state and secondary valency is 4 that is the coordination number okay number of ionizable chlorine atom is 2 second one if you see we have two agcl precipitated again it means this two chlorine atom presents outside the complex and hence the possible formula is this according to the given data dot cl2 okay not dot cl2 okay cl2 so from here again the primary valency is 2 and secondary valency again is the coordination number 6 okay so the third one you see there is no precipitation here it means all the molecules ions are present inside the complex so we'll have pt so basically we can write this as h2 pt cl6 this way also you can write down h2 pt cl6 so primary valency here is is the oxidation number so primary valency is oh this is again we don't have don't know condition no so hcl is there what should be the primary valency here and secondary valency secondary valency to 6 we are getting what is the primary valency here plus 4 i think we should write it down this way the correct representation here is this no correct representation here is this subject this is second or uh, the third one chlorine is the donor from hcl so we can write down this as ptcl4 dot 2 hcl like this right there is no charge on this complex that's why the primary valency is zero here secondary valency is 6 the hcl itself is van de gand a uh, chlorine is the donor atom there lone pair of chlorine okay. so i want it ionized it is there in the complex so see okay yes sir i'm writing down this formula based on this data if it is outside if i write no h2 then it will ionize also why sir like c sorry it will be h2 ptcl6 then no h2 ptcl yes h2 ptcl6 if you write that won't you know satisfy the value which is given over here right it says zero agcl see actually primary valency is also we consider the number of ionizable chlorine atom because of that only will have the charge on the complex yes sir right. so 
if you have like this you see cl2 present outside you see the primary valency is the number of protein which is present outside the complex here here all protein will write down inside right but oxidation state if you check this you can also write down this way i am not you no know, writing down the primary valency with respect to the oxidation state here because if you write down this one h2ptcl6 then the charge on platinum you are getting as plus 2 minus 2 minus 6 so plus 4 you are getting over here right yes, but plus 4 is not the primary valency actually what happens this out of 6 cl 4 cl satisfies here the primary valency of this right but this agcl that precipitate here this is only possible when the chlorine is present outside the complex right yes, yes. and we also know the primary valency is nothing but the ionizable ionizable uh, you know chlorine and chlorine atom or any, any other atom which is present right so here you see here ionization is possible h plus and this ptcl6 2 minus we get okay ionization is there but chlorine does not comes out like this so like this you can you know write but this is the most appropriate way to represent the molecular formula of this since this satisfies that there is no precipitation there is no ionization in this complex we can see here still we have ionization that's okay. why this way you can write but in some book they have written this way also as far as agcl precipitation is concerned this also holds true because this chlorine won't go out into the solution this chlorine also won't go out into the solution so both way you can represent but primary valency here since there is no ionization of chlorine atom we are considering this to be zero sir but the primary valency isn't a dependent on the number oh okay okay uh, sorry sorry on um, oh, sir i actually um, made a mistake sorry okay fourth one you try fourth one what is the primary valency you are getting in fourth one so only three. one chlorine atom should be outside right so 4 nh3 or 1 cl should be inside right so 5 uh, you know is the secondary valency and the primary valency would be sir so three so one i'll write on fourth one wait Yeah. Yes, correct. So since one chlorine atom gets precipitated, so formula should be CONH three four Cl two and Cl. This is the possible formula we can write because the only one precipitation is there. Okay, so it's um, primary valency. We have Three CL, no harm. Huh? Secondary valency is six. Four plus two, six. Primary valency is what? Only one chlorine atom that goes out. Okay, and minus two will have here. Primary valency would be three. Sir, so in the previous one, why can't we say that the primary valency is four? Uh, it was one second. I'll check that. I think uh, Pt NH three twice and Cl two. In this case, what we are getting, we are getting primary valency as zero. Obviously, zero here. Yeah, the zero here, and secondary valency as four. Only secondary valency. Here we have primary valency. One. You get here primary valency. This is fine. See, actually, one thing you have to, you must take care here. This two chlorine atom, which is present inside, this satisfies both valency, right? Primary as well as secondary, right? So secondary valency, if I have written six, right? So this we are already considering here. So we won't consider these two chlorine atom if we write the primary valency here. The same thing I am doing here. Only. one thing this difference here is what 
usually if you see the last one is the coordination theory we have discussed that primary valency corresponds to the oxidation state of the metal so if you find out the oxidation state we are getting it as plus 3 but primary valency in this compound is the valency which considers uh, the negative ion which which you know which satisfies only primary valency secondary valency wala we are not considering here so in this two chlorine atom it satisfies both primary as well as secondary so while calculating the primary valency will count only those atoms which are present outside the complex okay so here also you see if you write down this way or this way obviously there is no chlorine present outside the complex hence primary valency is zero right primary valency is two primary valency is two here there is nothing outside no chlorine outside primary valency is zero right this chlorine why we are not considering primary valency again i am repeating because this satisfies both primary as well as secondary so here on the basis of this data we consider only those ions which satisfies only primary valency that is why yes in the last class you gave that same fourth example and you told primary valency is 3 yes we are talking about this compound fourth one yes so the fourth yes. one so the question is what question is the primary valency so primary valency we consider only see it's basically the language that is written okay if you because if you look at the coordinates wernert's coordination theory the primary valency corresponds to the oxidation state of the metal so what is the oxidation state of cobalt here it is plus 3 right is it yes, according sir. to this the primary valency should be 3 but that is the maximum value out of 3 two chlorine atom satisfies us that is five the secondary valency also that we are considering here in 6 that's why in this case based on the data given we only consider those atom chlorine atom here in this case which is present outside the complex according to that only will write down the primary valency why this we are not considering because this contributes into the secondary valency as well that's why we are not considering this only this one we are okay okay so this kind of questions easy questions you will get you will easily understand that what is the possible structure of the molecule in wernert's coordination theory so one kind of question is this another kind of question they can give you the formula and they can ask you the like the primary valency or secondary valency is given they can ask you the number of ionizable chlorine atom okay like suppose in this one so there are many different kinds of question possible in this one you see if they give you this formula and says the primary valence the secondary valency is 4 for this one secondary valency is 4 what is the number of ionizable what is the number of ions we get in the solution this kind of questions they can frame okay this is another type they can also ask you how many you know moles of agcl precipitate when this molecule with secondary valency 4 reacts with agno3 this kind of question means other way here and there they can change the question this kind of question they can ask on the basis of you know the, the molecular formula they can also ask you the order of molar conductivity again that depends upon the number of ions any of these kind of questions possible here in wernert's coordination theory other than this uh, you know there is not there is no possibility of getting any other kind of questions right this is the first bonding theory which obviously fails uh, reason and the drawback i have given you already in the last class so to overcome this we got the new theory the another theory of bonding that we call it as valence bond theory valence bond theory again we have you know postulates and then you know based on that postulates we can find out the bonding of coordination compound all these things we are going to is a very important topic this one is write down the another theory of bonding of coordination complex that is valence bond theory vbt in short write down this theory mainly deals with
deals with the geometry geometry and and the magnetic property magnetic property of the complex and the magnetic property of the complex okay the main postulates are the first point write down the main postulates the first point the central metal atom cma the central metal atom loses a definite number of electrons to form iron a central metal atom loses a definite number of electrons to form iron this is the valency of the metal again i am repeating the central metal atom loses a required number of electrons to form ions definite number of electrons to form ions this number is the valency of the is the valency of the um, of the metal next one depending on the coordination number the central metal atom and when i say central metal atom write down cma okay depending upon the coordination number the cma has equal number of vacant the cma has equal number of vacant sp and d orbitals these orbitals forms the cma has equal number of vacant sp spd orbitals these orbitals forms hybrid orbitals forms hybrid orbitals together right and that thing is same like the number of atomic orbital combines equal number of hybrid orbital forms okay that is same over here so it is very much similar to the you know yeah a little bit similar to the valence bond theory in the simple compound simple compound okay depending on the coordination number the central metal atom has equal number of vacant sp and d orbitals these orbitals forms hybrid orbitals together okay this is same till here now the difference here is the third point the difference is in case of strong ligand in case of strong ligand there may be some rearrangement there may be some rearrangement of electrons in the in the atomic 
orbitals against against the unsure right one thing here i said in case of strong ligand okay so what is a strong and weak ligand we haven't discussed yet okay this will understand when we do cft that is crystal field theory okay there i will tell you how to find out basically you have to memorize that which ligand is strong and weak and not that difficult if you solve some questions you will memorize it easily but for this one i'll let you know that this particular ligand is weak ligand or a strong ligand okay so this is the rearrangement against the hunstrom right next fourth one the ligand and and the metal bonds and and metal bonded with bonded with coordinate bond which contains which has considerable amount of polarity considerable amount of polarity right means the bond is polar now the last point here is the same thing if there is unpaired electron if the complex contains if the complex contains unpaired electron then it is paramagnetic otherwise diamagnetic diamagnetic if all electrons are paired so third point is the new thing we have here otherwise you know all other things easy right depending upon the coordination number we can have the we can we can have the understanding of uh, you know hybridization of the complex and hence we can understand the geometry of the complex also so this table all of you have drawn all of you have written this yes sir okay so this table you draw one side we have coordination number cn stands for coordination number and then we have geometry and then we have hybridization coordination number could be 2 3 4 5 6 geometry is uh, uh just a second i'll have some space here 4 and then 5 and then 6 if it is 2 then the geometry is linear hybridization is sp if it is 3 then it is trigonal planar hybridization is sp2 if it is 3 then two different geometries are possible according to the hybridization if it is tetrahedral hybridization is sp3 if it is a square planar is dsp2 
for coordination number 5 For coordination number five, two different geometries are possible: trigonal bipyramidal or square pyramidal. And the hybridization is: we can have either a DSP three or SP three D. Keep this in mind. it is not like trigonal bipyramidal is dsp3 and square pyramidal is sp3d it could be anything okay here we have this is thing the triadal sp3 the square planar is dsp2 if it is 6 then we can have a square octahedral or square bipyramidal both are the same thing only octahedral or square by square by pyramid and the hybridization is d2 sp3 or sp3 d2 Yes, am I audible? Yes. Okay. No, no, no. See, guys, whether the geometry is TBP or a square pyramidal, it depends upon the molecule. Okay, it has nothing to do with the geometry. Do with the hybridization here. okay don't consider this as tbp is dsp3 or square pyramidal is sp3d okay it's not like that one more thing here this d2 sp3 and sp3d2 is what see here if you write down d2 sp3 means in this how this hybrid orbital forms this hybrid orbital forms by the combination of two 3d orbital plus one 4s orbital and three 4p orbital right these are the numbers we have sp b sp3 okay so one 3d two 3d one 4s and three 4p So here you see we have 4s 4p orbital, and along with this we have two inner shell orbitals. 3d orbital is there, 4d is not there. So there is inner shell orbitals present here. When you write down d2 sp3, d2 sp3 hybrid orbital forms when 3d combines with 4s and 4p. So this is inner shell orbitals, hence we call it as low spin complex this kind of orbital it forms low spin complex because inner shell orbital is involved into this low spin complex but on the other hand if you write down d2 sp3 sorry sp3 d2 this means this means we have 4s plus 4p plus 4d Right, this kind of combination is there. It means it is high spin complex. Okay, this is the term we use: high spin complex. Just a second, Ayush. Just a second. Okay, one more thing: low spin complex is generally forms like low spin complex generally forms. with a strong ligand in case of strong ligand low spin complex generally forms high spin complex forms when we have weak ligand what is a strong and weak ligand we'll discuss that okay just to write it down here we'll see that what is a strong ligand and what is weak ligand okay okay this is again i'll go back yes copy this
Wait, Aditya, just a second. Wait. Low spin means when lower d orbital involves, then it is low spin complex. Just that term we use. When the inner shell d orbital involves, it is low spin complex. When outer shell 4s, 4p, 4d involves, it is high spin complex. Okay. So these are the postulates of valence bond theory. Based on this, we can find out the geometry plus the magnetic nature, right? Whether the molecule is paramagnetic, diamagnetic, if it is paramagnetic, uh, then how many unpaired electrons, all those informations we can get. One by one, we'll see. One more very important thing is here. Uh, all these discussion that we are doing, out of all these, the coordination number six is the most important one. Coordination number six is the most important one. Mostly they ask question from this only, coordination number six, okay? But we'll discuss all the, uh, you know, uh, coordination number like four, five, and six we'll discuss. So first of all, examples we write down here. Example we are taking for coordination number four. First one. See this question. The question is, we have NiCl4, two negative, is found to be paramagnetic. Is found to be paramagnetic. Explain hybridization and geometry. It's hybridization. And geometry. Okay. Now, for you, for your information, all halide ions are weak nickel. Okay. Halide ions are weak ligand that you should know. X minus are weak ligand. Must remember this. And generally. Strong ligands are those in which the carbon is the donor atom. If carbon is the donor atom, then the ligand are said to be strong ligand in general. These two things you must keep in mind. But once you solve some questions, you'll understand that which ligand is strong and which ligand is weak. Got it? Fine. So how do we do this question, you see? First of all, what do you do? You find out the oxidation state of the metal, which is here plus two. So nickel has how many electrons? 28. If you draw the electronic configuration, argon 4s2, 3d8. Okay. For Ni2+, plus, because the metal ion is Ni2+, plus, so this would be argon with 3D8. So if I draw the orbital diagram here, this is 3D, for example. This is 4S. And this is 4P. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So 3D has 8 electrons. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay, and 
and this is uh, chorus chorus and this is 4p and 4d is not required 4d is this side not required because coordination number is 4 only we required only four orbitals here so that we can get four hybrid orbitals in which the ligands four ligands can donate its lone pair right so what happens this four orbitals empty orbitals goes under the hybridization before the bonding and it forms four sp3 hybridized hybrid orbitals in which the four chlorine atom donates its electron pair right the ligand donates its electron pair and makes a coordinate bond with the metal right obviously if you look at this the hybridization is sp3 geometry is tetrahedral right there are two unpaired electrons two unpaired electrons and hence the molecule is paramagnetic which is also given in the question yes cl minus is a weak ligand so there is no pairing against the hans group correct now suppose if this is a strong ligand like cl obviously is a weak ligand then there is no pairing against the hans rule if it is strong then this electron pair this jumps over here and makes this orbital vacant in that case then this orbital also will take part in the reaction and one two and two orbitals will take from this from from this p sub shell then the configuration will be or the hybridization would be d s p2 in that case square planar geometry okay this depends upon the nature of the ligand that you should know whether the ligand is weak or strong to keep these two terms in mind okay this helps you a lot in solving this kind of questions now you see the second question here we have a molecule say nico4 carbonyl group is is diamagnetic diamagnetic explain hybridization and geometry try this one
Tell me the answer. CO, the carbonyl group CO, yes, DSP2 square planar, okay? CO is a strong field ligand that you should know, right? Carbonyl group is a strong field ligand. So there will be pairing against the Hans root, right? There's no uh, zero oxidation instead of nickel is zero here. Hence, Ni is argon 4s2 3d8. Okay, so this is 3d orbital. Then it is 4s 4p. Since it is coordination number four, we require only four vacant orbital. 3D, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and 4S will have two. Right, 4S will have two. Then what happens, you see, okay, all of you are getting DSP2. There will be pairing against the Hansud. So this two electron, it jumps here into the inner orbital of 3D, makes this 4S orbital vacant, okay? So after this rearrangement, the Orbital diagram is this. We have two electrons in each of these orbitals. This is vacant, this is vacant, 4s and 4p. So this goes under hybridization and it forms again sp3 hybridized orbital this is sp3 hybridized orbital so hybridization for this complex is sp3 all electrons so it is diamagnetic diamagnetic geometry is tetrahedral right this is what the answer is how did you get DSP2? Oxidation state is zero, no? Yes, so oxidation state is zero. Try this one. NiCl4 and cyanide is also a strong ligand. NiCl4 2 minus is the complex. Find its magnetic property, geometry, and hybridization.
अच्छा इज इट डी एस पी टू यू आर गेटिंग या इट इज डी एस पी टू इट्स नॉट एस पी थ्री यस बिकॉज हियर द ऑक्सीडेशन स्टेट इज प्लस टू सो वट एवर यू हैव डन इन द प्रीवियस केस दैट इज एप्लीकेबल हियर राइट सो दिस वुड बी इफ आई राइट डाउन द इलेक्ट्रॉनिक कॉन्फिग्रेशन ऑफ एन आई टू प्लस इट इज आर्गन फोर एस जीरो एंड थ्री डी ए ऑर्बिटल डायग्राम इज दिस वन टू थ्री फोर एंड फाइव Eight zero electrons, zero electrons. Now, since this CN is strong ligand, then there would be pairing against the unstrung, and this electron, which is unpaired, it jumps back into this orbital and makes the electron paired, and hence this orbital becomes empty here. So here, after this rearrangement, the orbital diagram looks like this one. Two, three, four. Each of these orbitals will have two, two electron. One orbital is vacant. Four s, and it is four p. So it is three d, four s, and four p. So three d orbital, four s, and four p. Two orbital here. So this goes under hybridization, and it forms one, two, three. For P S P two hybridized hybrid orbital, so hybridization is D S P two. Geometry is square planar. Magnetic properties is diamagnetic. Okay, these three things. These three things we can understand. Okay, from this. Now, if I ask you one more question, they ask in this particular kind of geometry that which d orbital is involved in this geometry? Because we know we have d five d orbitals we have d x y d y z d z x d x y y square and d z square, right? So out of this five, which d orbitals is involved in this uh, geometry? Could you answer this? Can you repeat? Sorry. So can you repeat once again? I said we have five d orbitals, right? In three d subshell, we have five d orbitals. So out of the five, which d orbitals involves in this geometry? Because only one d orbital is involved. No, only one d is there. So which d which d orbital it is? Out of the five. Okay, see, you have to first of all, uh, 3D is a subshell, guys. Okay, Adhar Aditya, 3D is a subshell. I'm talking about the orbital. So within 3D, we'll have five uh, orbitals. Like for 3D, it should be 3D x y, 3D y z, 3D z x, 3D x square y square, 3D z square. Okay. So which D orbital is this one? Okay. Fifth one. Acha. Why it is the x square y square? Ah, uh, Dhyan. Just guessing. Okay, fine. By the way, your answer is correct. The answer is the x square y square. Uh, there is no, you know, uh, you know, defined logic for this. That this is why this is happening. Okay. This is factual actually. But uh, I'll I'll discuss one small thing here. Ah, uh, probably with that you can understand. That which the orbital is involved, right? Obviously, it is not a you know a, a given method in the book. But yes, from this particular thing, if you do not know, if you forget uh, in the exam, then you can think like this. You will get the answer. Okay, what the orbital or which the orbital is involved? No, it does matter. It does matter because the orbital uh, has its own orientation around the nucleus. That's why it does matter. See, actually, what happens? Square planar geometry is what 
with geometry you can understand it is not that difficult also all of you will get it the square planar geometry is something like this once again yeah the square planar geometry is this correct suppose this is the square planar geometry we have and metal is present somewhere here in the center of the square and how do we get the square planar geometry when the ligands are attached at these corners yes or no so to metal to ligands to get attached with this metal at these corners of the square it has to approach the metal from these directions i'll i'll show you what direction it is um what i was about ha huh. so uh, if the metal has to form if the you know ligand has to form d uh you know the square planar complex then this must have to approach the metal in these from these directions along these you know lines we can say or along these directions it must have to approach this way so suppose all the four ligands are coming from this direction and it is trying to approach the metal for the bonding it is trying to donate its electron to the metal from these directions all these directions the ligands are coming correct so obviously the orbital and this metal has all the d orbitals correct all the d orbitals so obviously the orbitals which are present along these lines that particular orbital will have the maximum probability to involve in bonding yes or no are you getting me the angle or the you know like the line through along which the ligand is approaching the metal along that particular line whatever orbital is present if it is right if it is whatever orbital is present that particular orbital will have the maximum probability to involve in the bonding because the ligand is approaching towards that particular orbit now you see the another thing if you consider this line obviously the square diagonal it bisects at 90 degree this is the 90 degree so what i am trying to say here that i can assume that this axis is suppose this i am assuming as x axis and this i am assuming as y axis why because the angle is 90 degree and perpendicular to this one suppose we have a z axis which is not required here in this case but is required in the other cases right so obviously we know this dx square y square orbitals are, are are along this axis we have the axial orbital it is present along this axis which orbital is this d x square y square is it all these things i have discussed in chemical bonding already right so this orbital is what this orbital is d x square y square that's why in this square planar complex the orbital that is involved is d x square y square because the ligand is approaching head on to this orbital did you get this yes sir right yes sir now what is square by pyramidal we have these four ligands and along with these four ligands we have two more one is from this side and other one is from this side yes or no that is only square by pyramidal so if i ask you which d orbitals are involved in square planar geometry square by pyramidal geometry what is your answer x square y square and z d x square y square and d z square yes very good so with this kind of you know uh, you know here uh, you know the pictorial diagram that we have discussed you can have the idea that which orbital is involved in a given geometry okay d orbital there was many times these questions in neat exam even in j also there was this question okay so write down this uh, you know um, this thing that we have discussed here the geometry here and the d orbitals involved geometry and d orbital so if the geometry is square planar the d orbital is 
dx square y square. If the geometry is square octahedral or square bipyramidal, the orbitals are dx square y square and dz square. If it is square pyramidal, square pyramidal, it is only dx square y square. If it is TBP, trigonal bipyramidal, it is only dz square. So this is the orbital d orbitals involved in the geometry. Sir? Yeah, tell me. Sir, so can we say that the PZ orbital is left out in the 4P orbitals? Uh, in which one? The other out of P the 4P orbitals, out of uh, the three 4P orbitals, PZ will be left out, sir. PZ, uh, you know, we cannot say whether it is PZ or PX or PY, okay. Uh, mostly PZ, you know, we don't consider because PZ normally uh, forms sigma bond first. That's why we always assume internuclear axis along the other axis, right? But yes, they won't ask you which orbital is left behind in P subshell, whether it's PX, PY, PZ, because that is not in our control. You cannot, you know, say that theoretically. Okay, sir. Understood? Yes. So this is also important. So coordination number four we have discussed. Now you see coordination number five. Same kind of thing you have to do. Nothing, you know, difference here. But yes, uh, we'll do one or two, one, two examples so that you can understand it. It's important also. So we have a question molecule that is FeCO5. FeCO5. Okay. And the information with this is FeCO5 is found to have found to have zero dipole moment. Mu net is zero for this. So zero dipole moment. Find its hybridization. and geometry. Try this one. Sir, what is that uh, coordination number is equal to 5 on top? Coordination number is 5. Of uh, Fe, sir? Yes, this is the complex. Coordination number is always defined for metal. Yes, What's the charge of the complex? Nothing. Zero. Oh. No, the you know the dipole moment won't affect hybridization. But yes, with dipole moment, see you try this Aditya once. Okay, you will uh, understand why this dipole moment thing is given. Okay, try once to do it. Okay, sir. What is the geometry, Sisti? Square by pyramidal. CO is a strong ligand, correct? Yes. 
What is the geometry, Pratham, you are getting? Okay, see this. Uh, obviously, the oxidation state is zero and uh, iron has 26 electron. So the electronic configuration is argon 4s2, 3d6. Okay. Okay, fine. So Anahita is getting trigonal bipedal. Fine. Ravi Kiran also trigonal bipedal. Fine. Okay. So um, 4s2, 3d6. So 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, and 4s2. But since it is a strong field ligand, CEO. And arrangement against the Hans group, right? So this electron, this two electron will jump into the inner shell. This comes over here. This comes over here. And this also will jump here in this shell. After this rearrangement, the orbital diagram is this. Okay. Five is the coordination number. So we required five vacant orbital. So one is this D, then S, and then P. So the hybridization is DSP3. DSP3 is the hybridization. Geometry, like I said, it can be TBP or it can be square by pyramidal. Which one is the correct geometry here that depends upon the information given in the question. Now you see the square, sorry, pyramidal, not bipyramidal, square pyramidal. Okay, so if you look at the both geometry here, TBP is this. This is TBP. And the square pyramidal is this. In a square pyramidal, what happens? Uh, this ligand, all these ligands, you see, because the bond has considerable amount of polarity. So because of this polarity, we have dipole moment, right? So because of these two dipole moment, we have a net dipole moment in this direction, net dipole moment in this direction, and these two cancels out. But because of this, we have in some mu net in the molecules. Mu net should not be equal to zero for a square pyramidal geometry. But if it is trigonal by pyramidal, this dipole moment will get cancelled by this dipole moment, and this dipole moment will get cancelled by this dipole moment. Right? So mu net is zero for TBP, trigonal by pyramidal. Since in the question it is given, mu net is equal to zero, hence the geometry for this particular complex is trigonal by pyramidal, it is not a square pyramidal. Yes, correct. Understood, no doubt in this. Yes, sir. Right, so some, some information will be given. Based on that, you can find out the geometry of the molecule. Like you see, the another one. NiCN5, 3 minus we have. And in this one, uh, it, it is given that it has two types of 
two type of anti cn bond length two type of anti cn bond length out of out of which four bond length are same are equal and one is different find out hybridization magnetic property and geometry of the molecule dsp3 answer for this question i am writing it down if you have any doubt you can tell me i will do this the hybridization will be dsp3 and it is uh, diamagnetic it is diamagnetic and the geometry is square pyramidal because four bond lengths are same so square pyramidal geometry any doubt in this finished all of you next you see coordination number 6 coordination number 6 uh the first one is this is the most important one we have co cobalt nh3 and plus 3 on the complex hybridization and geometry for this one it is d2sp3 nh3 is strongly ligand nh3 is strong so cobalt plus 3 oxidation state and its configuration is argon 3d6 
okay so 3d6 the geometry is the the orbital diagram is this One, two, one, two, three, four, and since NH three is a strong ligand, so they will be pairing against the against the Hans rule, and it gives this one. then this six orbitals will go into hybridization and forms d2 sp3 hybridized orbital okay geometry is octahedral and all the electrons are paired so it is diamagnetic and since we have d2 sp3 hybridization so it is it is low spin complex you see low spin complex forms because of the rearrangement against the hans rule and rearrangement against the hans rule is possible when the ligand is strong that's why whenever low spin complex forms we always have strong ligand okay write down this thing. with the you know with the hybridization whether it is low spin or high spin is the nature of ligand we can identify or we can understand sir how do we determine if it's octahedral or square bipyramidal both are same thing any one you write it is correct okay Sir, so in the actual molecule, will both structures exist uh, simultaneously at like, the same both time? Are, see, the structure is same. And two names are there. Octahedral is same as the square bipyramidal. Same thing. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. For a square planar, also you can say low spin, high spin. But generally, we don't, you know. Uh, assign this kind of you know terms with square planar geometry generally with a four coordination number but yes if you have to pick between the two dsp2 is the low spin complex but sp3 we don't say whether it is low or high right but d2 sp3 is uh, obviously low spin complex if you talk about sp3 d and dsp3 if you have to choose then dsp3 is the low spin complex sp3 d is the high spin complex but mostly we talk about these two terms in coordination number 6 yes sir okay so one is an one exception we have here right nsc i told you it is a strong ligand but in some cases nh3 behaves as a weak field ligand only one or one case we have here uh, with the metals like nickel okay so this one you have to memorize because these are the exceptions you have to keep this in mind for example you see uh, if you write down this complex could you find out the hybridization and geometry here ni nh3 6 2 in this one first of all you write down one note and then you can try one note you write down with most of the metal with most of the metal nh3 behaves as behaves as strong ligand behaves as strong ligand but with some metal like nickel 
it behaves as a weak field ligand. This is one of the drawback we can say, or exception of VBT, valence bond theory. Right? So could you repeat the last point? Yeah. With most of the central metal ion or atom, NH3 behaves as a strong ligand. But with some metal ion, like nickel, here it is Ni2+, it behaves as a weak field ligand. It behaves as a weak field again. This is the drawback of VBT. This is the drawback of VBT. Try this one now. Hybridization, geometry and magnetic property. sp3 d2 yes sp3 d2 you are getting octahedral complex how many unpaired electrons are there two. how many unpaired electrons two unpaired electrons that's right so you see there is no pairing of electrons okay so here in this complex nh3 is behaving as a weak field ligand okay which usually does not happen and it's three usually a strong ligand but here it is behaving as a weak ligand Okay, so this example you must remember. Okay, I'll quickly write down this. Ni2 plus is the charge we have, oxidation state, and its uh, electronic configuration is nickel has um, 28 electron, so it is argon 4s0 3d8. D8, then it is 4s and then it is 4p. Okay, so this pairing is not possible here, is not taking place, and hence this six orbital goes into hybridization sp3d2 and it forms sp3d2 hybridized orbital. So geometry is octahedral or a square pyramidal, bipyramidal paramagnetic with two unpaired electron magnetic with two unpaired electron unpaired electron you can also think of one thing here like if you try to understand this if you do not memorize also you can do this easily See, if you think of chalo, NH3 is a strong ligand, so pairing against the Hans rule. So what you will do, you will shift this electron pair here, right? You will have only one vacant orbital then. If you try to write down the hybridization of it, then DSP4 is not possible. Like you know, DSP3, D, this kind of hybridization is not possible, right? That's why this orbital won't take part in hybridization at all. Right, and hence it should not be vacant. That's why the pairing against the Hansel is not possible. Hence it is sp3 d2. Okay, now in this also they can also ask the magnetic moment of the complex. Okay, magnetic moment. Magnetic moment is calculated by this formula, which we have also done last year in atomic structure, written that n into n plus 2 dm, Bohr magneton where n is the number of unpaired electron, you substitute n value 2 here, 2 into 2 plus 2, 
that is root under 8 and that value is 2.83 bm. Okay, so this value you must remember. Sometimes they'll give you the, uh, the value of magnetic moment in the question. Right, so you should know, suppose for this question, for this question the magnetic moment is given. This complex has 2.83 magnetic moment. So first of all, what do you do? You just find out the number of unpaired electron with this value. So what you need to do? You need to equate this with root under n into n plus 2. Right. This should be equal to 2.83. But sometimes what happens, this is become this becomes very complex to solve this. You know, you square and then solve, solve the quadratic. It's difficult to do. So for that, you should memorize these values. When the magnetic moment is 2.83, the number of unpaired electron is 2. However, you can, you know, roughly you can put some value of n and you can find dot. Maximum 2, 3 unpaired electrons will be there, not more than that in most of the cases. But what point I'm trying to make, if you memorize these values, like 2.83 is a magnetic moment when the number of unpaired electron is 2, then this helps you a lot in solving the question. So once you know this value of n, you know how many electrons you have to left, you know, unpaired, and then you can think of the hybridization of the molecule. Similarly, if n value is three, like uh, this one, if uh, mu value is, suppose the magnetic moment, mu s we are getting 3.287 bm. 2.83 n value is 2, 3.287 n value is 3 we have, unpaired electron is 3, okay, with 3 you will get root under 15, so root under 15 you see it is somewhere in between 3 and 4, this is what we are this kind of you know uh, observations helps you a lot in solving this kind of questions. Okay, so with nickel, it uh, behaves as weak field ligand and it's three. Okay, one last question we'll see here. Try this one Cr NH3, six, C plus. Sir, what is chromium configuration? Chromium configuration? Electronic configuration? Yes, sir. What is 1, 3D5? You should know it. Argon, what is 1, 3D5? Okay, Siddharth. Other things, magnetic property. Is it die? I think Tripan, you have written Ulta. Should be D2, right? No, we are getting D3 only. Yes. 
I was getting D3 as P2. D3? Yes. How are you getting D3? The pairing will happen, sir. No, it's not. Oh. The pairing won't happen, sir. Sorry? So will pairing happen? No, no, no. Sir, so even this, though it's a strong field again. This is what the two things uh, we have discussed. No. Actually here, you know, in the question if they ask, usually they give the magnetic moment here. Mu value they'll give you. That is 3.28. This is the magnetic moment we observe. Then they'll ask you, what is the hybridization and all? So yes. why I'm doing this here? Because you should know that this chromium also, this is not happening. And one more thing, in coordination complex, D3 you don't consider. D3, uh, you know, um, what we say, hybridization is not possible. We are not getting D3 hybridization here. But this question was actually, when they ask you, they'll give you the magnetic moment value. With this, you will have the idea that how many unpaired electrons we should have. Okay. So here also my point is, here also it is behaving as weak field ligand. So these are the few exceptions we have of VBT, drawbacks of VBT. Right. So answer for this question, I'm not doing this. Answer is, it is D2SP3, low spin complex. Number of unpaired electron is three, and it is paramagnetic. How did you get diamagnetic, Aditya? Yes, correct, Shishti. Right, 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 Anjali. Okay, fine. So, so these two examples you must remember because it is not, you know, uh, because these are exceptions. So you must take care of this, especially that nickel oil example. This one, at least you can understand that D3 or hybridization is not possible here. So we, uh, we won't think of the pairing of electrons. Actually, the reason is NH3 is behaving as a weak field ligand. Okay. So these are the drawbacks of VBT. Okay. Uh, that's why, and the major drawbacks is what? That again, uh, you know, it could not explain the color of the complex and what color the complex shows. This also could not explain by valence bond theory. That's why we got the new theory after this, which we call it as crystal field theory. With crystal field theory, we can find out the color of the complex. Obviously, we cannot do theoretically because we need to know the wavelength of each color, right? And then only we can say, okay, this is the wavelength we are getting, so this is the color of the complex. So color thing you have to memorize, okay? okay. But yes, there it, the CFT, crystal field theory gives us the concept that how do we understand or how do we know that what color of the complex should be? How do we calculate the lambda value there, right? That we get from the CFT, crystal field theory. So next write down, the major drawback, one note you write down after this, the major drawback for VBT is it could not explain the color of the complex. Could not explain the color of the complex. Sir? Yes, sir. Sir? Hmm. So here it is a low spin complex or high spin complex? This one, low the spin. Previous question. Low spin only, sir. Yes, whenever D2 you write first, D2 SP3, then this C, this S and P belongs to fourth cell, right? 4S, 4P orbital is there, no? Yes. But this one is 3D. So lower spin complex is when the inner shell D orbital is involved in the hybridization. Okay, sir. Okay, high spin complex, when we have S, P, D, 4S, 4P, 4D, high spin. Okay. So, and is it possible to have uh, unpaired electrons when it's uh, like when some pairing takes place, but still unpaired electrons are remaining? Ah, that is also possible. Like all the electrons won't get paired. 
and uh, that that see everything depends upon the uh, characteristics of the molecule like you see uh, the one that you did this one what you did i think you did this one in this one you'll get three unpaired electron initially and then what you did you paired like this uh, right and you yes, said there's one unpaired electron yeah okay sir. this is what you did right but yes, this sir, okay. cannot do here because with this the number of unpaired electrons you are getting one and this does not satisfy well but it is possible yes. in some complex that there are five electrons unpaired electrons out of five two will get paired and accordingly will get the new value in the complex possible but okay. those kind of questions what happens uh, either they'll give you mu value then only you can find out that whether the electrons are getting paired or not or if five unpaired electrons are there then how many electrons are getting paired depending upon the mu value which should be given in the question okay yes sir yeah next write down crystal field theory the crystal field theory i'll give you a brief idea of it okay because if i dictate you the theory it takes a lot of time so there are so many things in this okay actually what happens first of all in this theory there is one assumption and what is the assumption assumption is that the ligands and the metal ion we consider as the point charge okay so assumption is what ligand and metal ion are considered as as point charge okay now it is point charge so there will be what there will be uh, you know this thing uh, electrostatic attraction ligand is negatively charged metal is, metal ion is positively charged so we'll have electrostatic attraction between them so the entire theory is based upon this particular assumption that ligand and metal will have electrostatic attraction but now what happens we have metals and d orbitals of metals are there right and ligands are trying to approach the metal right with its lone pair of electron and there are electrons present in d sub d orbitals of the metal already right so when this ligands approach the metal ion then uh, suppose we have certain electrons present in some of the orbitals of metals like this so some arrangement we have like randomly i have drawn this okay so when this ligand do tries to donate the electron pair right so these electrons repels the coming electron from the ligand okay repels in the sense what the orbital which consists uh, which have which has electron present into this the d orbitals of the metal in which the electrons are present those orbitals and the coming electron we have repulsion between the two so it is possible that some of the orbital has one electron two electron or some of the orbitals are vacant also right so obviously the orbitals which has electron they experience more repulsion and the orbitals which has no electron they experience less repulsion right so what we uh, can conclude from this that when this ligand tries to donate the electrons into the orbital of the metal right there will be uneven repulsion between the orbital and the electrons that comes from the metal that comes from the ligand right because of this uneven repulsion uneven repulsion means some of the orbitals experience very high repulsion and some of the orbitals experience less repulsion right because of the presence or absence of electron so because of this uneven repulsion this orbital splits into two sets of orbital mainly two sets depending upon the geometry we can have different different number of orbitals right it splits into two sets of orbitals which we call it as splitting of orbital and this is splitting we call it as crystal field splitting right in this splitting what happens some of the orbital goes on to the higher energy level and some of the orbital comes down to the lower energy level by maintaining i'm sorry by maintaining the average energy of the complex average energy will be maintained this will increase energy some positive value of delta o 
and some negative value of delta over here. So that average energy will be maintained. Like this, the splitting takes place. Okay. So this is what actually happens in the coordination complex. Okay. And this is crystal field theory. So to sum up all this, wait, yeah, just a second. To sum up all this, what we can say that crystal field theory is based upon the electrostatic attraction between the ligand and the metal ion. Why electrostatic attraction? Because we are that the ligand and the metal ion are the point charge. Okay. So when the electrons from the ligands approach the d orbital, right? So because of the electron already present in the d orbital, we'll have uneven repulsion in the d orbital, and hence the d orbital to minimize the repulsion, it splits into two part, okay, or two sets of orbital, or more than two also possible, depending upon the geometry. It is splits into two parts. This is splitting we call it as crystal field splitting. In this splitting, some of the orbitals goes on to the higher energy level. Some of the orbitals goes down to the lower energy level in order to maintain the average energy of the orbital. This is crystal field splitting. Did you understand the basics of it? Yes. Got it. So all these things are given in NCRT properly. They have written in NCRT. I would request all of you after the class, at least 10, 15 minutes you give to go through the entire theory of crystal field theory. Because if I dictate, it will take a lot of time. Because I'm not dictating this theory, whatever I said now. So I want you to go through once. Okay. I'm not dictating all these things. So uh, the thing is next, when this uh, orbital is split, right, this orbital is split into groups actually. When we have a octahedral complex, because this kind of splitting we observe in different, different geometry. So we'll have a splitting in octahedral complex. We'll have a splitting in uh, a square pyramidal complex. We'll have a splitting in tetrahedral complex, right? All these three splitting we'll see, right? Understood? So first of all, you write down, just basics write down here. According to this theory, according to this theory, the bonding in the coordination complex according to this theory the bonding in the coordination complex is splits sorry is completely electrostatic is completely electrostatic Again, I'm repeating, uh, according to this theory, the bonding in the coordination complex is completely electrostatic. And we assume and we assume the ligand and the metal ion as a point charge. Point charge. Okay. The complex. Repeat, sorry. Can you repeat? Sir? And we assume the second line or the first line from the beginning. I'll, I'll repeat from the beginning. Wait. According to this theory, the bonding in the complex is completely electrostatic. In which the ligand and the metal ion are considered as point charge. In which the ligand and the metal ion are considered as point charge. Next line, the complex is regarded as the combination of The complex is regarded as the combination of CMA, that is central metal atom, the complex is regarded as the combination of CMA surrounded by the ligands.
okay so in, in the entire theory i am cutting short to it because it takes a lot of time again i am telling you this uh, just one line after this you add uh, because of the interaction between the ligands and the metal ion because of the interaction between the ligands and the metal ions the d orbital experience uneven repulsion the d orbital experience uneven repulsion and it splits into and it splits into and it splits into two sets of different orbitals having different energy and it splits into two sets of different orbital having different energy so these sets that we get that the that, that you know the splitting of orbital it happens in this way that all non axial orbital for example dxy dyz dzx all these non axial orbital it goes into one set okay and this set we call it as t2g orbitals t2g orbitals these are non axial orbitals axial orbitals are called eg orbitals for example dx square y square and d z square these are axial orbitals right this t2g and eg you don't have to think about it these are spectroscopic terms we call it as spectroscopic terms just a group of orbitals it said to be this and this uh not required this but uh, when we distribute orbitals then this uh, grouping this terms helps us to understand the distribution of electron that's why we have given this term right not much important fine so this is splitting of orbitals right it uh, there are certain factors which affects the splitting of orbitals okay like we have uh, you know the position of transition metal oxidation state and other things right there are various factors which affect the splitting of orbitals so how is splitting takes place in different different complex whether it is you know octahedral or square pan or tetrahedral that we'll discuss a bit later first we'll see that what are the factors which affects the splitting of orbitals right write down the magnitude next line the magnitude of the splitting the magnitude of splitting depends on the following factor depends on the following factors these factors are not important only two things you know you have to keep in mind here otherwise it is not at all important okay the first one here the first point is a bit important and the last one okay just you need to know the uh, you know the basic result of it write down the position of the first factor it is position of transition metal in the periodic table in the periodic table write down the magnitude of splitting increases
as we go down the group. The magnitude of splitting increases as we go down the group. For example, if you compare the splitting in PTCL4, PTCL4, 2 minus, and PDCL4, 2 minus, okay. As we go down the group, the magnitude of splitting increases. So platinum produces more splitting than palladium. Okay. The second factor we have, oxidation state of metal. Oxidation state of metal. As oxidation state of CMA, central metal atom increases, the splitting increases. Because more positive charge, more will be the attraction and hence more will be the repulsion in the d orbital, more will be the splitting. Okay, so easily you can compare this FeCN6 3 minus and FeCN6 4 minus obviously in the first one the repulsion will be more. Okay, one more uh, in fact two more if, we have. if the charge on the central metal atom If the charge on the central metal atom increases, splitting increases. Oh, just a second. It's the same thing, no? Charge on the central metal. Oh, it's just. Wait, wait, wait. If the charge on the central metal atom is same, if it is same, then the then the metal with metal with higher number of uh, d electrons higher number of d electrons will have lesser splitting. So if you consider this CO2 plus, suppose you have a complex in which you have CO2 plus oxidation state and Ni2 plus oxidation state. So in CO2 plus, the splitting would be more because if you look at the configuration of this, it is argon 3D7. Argon 3D7. And for nickel, it is argon 3D8. So more electrons, lesser will be the repulsion. The most important one is the nature of ligands. Okay, this is what I was talking about. Strong ligands produce more repulsion and weak ligands produce lesser repulsion. The magnitude of repulsion actually gives, the, gives us the idea about the nature of ligands. So write down into this. The ligands which affect the ligands which affects only a small degree of crystal filled splitting the ligands which affects only a small degree of crystal filled splitting are called weak filled 
ligands Okay, the ligands which affects only a small degree of crystal field splitting are called weak field ligands and those which affect a large splitting are called strong field ligand And those which affects a lot is splitting are called strong fielding. And next line. When these ligands are when these ligands are arranged in order. arranged in order of the magnitude of their crystal field splitting of the magnitude of their crystal field splitting will get a series will get a series which is called a spectrochemical series will get a series which is called a spectrochemical series just a second okay so a spectrochemical series you write down just a second
Okay, this is spectrochemical series. From I minus to ETOH, these are weak phase ligand or weak ligand simply. These are moderate. And all these from NH3 to this, these are a strong ligand in general. Strong ligand. Actually, water, if you see water is present in between, whatever ligand is present out right side of water, ligands are considered as strong ligands in general. And including water, whatever ligand is present left to the water molecule, these are weak ligands. So whether the ligand is, ligand is weak or is strong, that idea we get from the splitting in the orbital, right? Crystal field is splitting. Copy this down. Okay, so this is the uh, spectrochemical series and the nature of the ligand, weak or strong, okay? So if the two uh, complex is given and the ligands are different, then depending upon the nature of the ligand, weak is strong or moderate, you can easily compare the splitting in the complex, okay? Now you write down crystal field splitting in octahedral complex. Three complex we have to discuss, octahedral complex, uh, a square planar and tetrahedral. So octahedral complex we'll discuss in detail. Everything is same only in other two complex. So we'll just see in the other two complex, we'll just see the splitting of orbitals or the orbitals splits. Okay. So we need to, first of all, uh, you know, um, uh, we need to first of all identify that which two orbitals will have the maximum repulsion. Like, which two orbitals will have the maximum repulsion? Because the complex is octahedral, so one ligand comes from the top, another one comes from the bottom. This is the third one, then fourth one, fifth and then sixth. 
right? So in all these direction, the ligand approach the metal. Metal is present here in the center. All these are ligands. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So we can easily you know, consider the axis along these lines. Along these lines, we can consider the axis because the angle is 90 degree. And one like X, Y, and Z axis. Obviously, along this line, we have dx square, y square orbital. Right? dx square, y square orbital present along this line. Right? And along this line, we have dz square orbital. So, the two orbital set of orbital dz and dz. T two G is all non-axial orbital, dxy, dyz, and dzx. And T two G EZ has uh, two orbitals, which is uh, dx square, y square, and dz square orbital. So when uh, this ligand approaches the metal to form an octahedral complex, okay. So EG orbital will have the more repulsion, and this will go to the higher energy level and T2G will come down to the lower energy level by maintaining the average energy of the, uh, of the complex, okay? So what is, how the splitting takes place, I'll show you the diagram for that. You have to draw this, just a second. This one you see. This is for tetrahedral complex, sorry, octahedral complex. Okay. See this what happens here. This y axis is the energy, and this x axis is the distance decreases between the metal and the gas. Like if you're going left to right here, means ligands are coming closer to the metal. Okay, so this x axis you write down distance decreases between the metal and ligands. So as the distance decreases, you see the repulsion starts increasing because the ligands are approaching the metal. The energy of this orbital starts increasing, it goes to the value here. This is step one energy goes to this value. Then further the electrons, the ligands comes closer and the orbital is splits into two parts. One is this, other one is this. You see this one? This one is EG and this one is T2G. By maintaining the average energy, average energy, right? This will let it be very center and all, it's not required. Simply average energy level is here. Now this value is 0.6 delta O. It's not zero or not. It is O. O stands for octahedral. Okay. It's basically the unit of unit of energy in this complex. Octahedral. Okay. This equals to a fixed value of energy for a given complex. This value will be different for different different complexes. Okay. Those energy we don't have to calculate. Right. It's not required. 0.6 delta O. 
below it is minus 0.4 delta o right total energy is delta o that's how the splitting takes place copy down this first Sir, why is it minus point four delta O? Because the energy is decreasing from that point. So minus just represent the energy decreases. It's just a sign convention, you can see. Yes. Sir, can we say that the energy of the dr orbitals in uh, step one raises up to uh, 0.2 delta naught or delta O? 0.2 delta O. No, 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 it's not 0.2. Sum is this plus this is delta O only. Plus minus sign is just represent the energy is increasing for this and decreasing for this. That is this. Total sum is delta O only. Okay, yes sir, yes sir. Right. Nothing in step one, as the ligands are coming closer to the metal, slowly the energy of D orbital is increasing and it reaches the maximum value and then it's, it splits into the two parts. Step one is the excited state. Uh, excited state, uh, we cannot say excited state uh, because in that excited state generally when electron jumps into the higher energy level. In the transition of electron is not there, but because of the interaction of the electron between d orbital and the ligand, overall the energy of d orbital is increasing. It goes to a maximum value before splitting. Sir, and the way we have assumed the ligands are up, approaching the metal atom uh, like along the axis, is it only an assumption or is it actually like that? No, no, no. Actually, we are assuming octahedral complex. No. To form an octahedral complex, obviously ligand has to approach this way. Otherwise, it won't form. It, yes, sir. It but then, there to, uh, tell me. Sir, but then uh, the axis can be uh, like uh, oriented in any other uh, way also, right? Or other or complex. See, see, just a second. Uh, actually, this way I have, you know, we explain things this way so that you can memorize it, you can understand it. But actually what happens when suppose the ligands are approaching from, you know, uh, from the other side, you know, from the every side up towards the metal, then obviously the ligand also repel each other. No, there will be some crowding and then some lone pair with lone pair the ligands are coming. So lone pair will also repel each other. Then the ligands will arrange themselves in such a way 
so that the repulsion will be minimum and then actually yes, the geometry of the complex we gain we get right yes, we are sir. understanding this in a different way what i am telling you that to form an octahedral complex the ligand has to approach this way so that you can understand this that these orbitals are involved and why see if i tell you this thing no that ligands approach the metal to minimize the crowding and repulsion of the electron pair uh, you know it will arrange this way and forms the octahedral complex like that also i can explain but then when i tell you that this orbital these two orbitals goes to the higher energy level then you will ask me sir why these two orbitals goes to the higher energy level to clear this thing yes, we are understanding it this way because if octahedral complex is forming the ligand has to approach along these lines and along these lines we have these two orbitals present that's why in these two orbitals we have maximum repulsion so we are trying to understand this in a different way but the actual thing is ligands are randomly approaching the metal and whatever the you know arrangement of ligands in the space which provides the minimum energy to the complex and maximum stability that will be the geometry of the complex okay sir yes sir got it yeah all of you drawn this yes sir okay so this is the splitting of orbitals now you see if you want to distribute the electron into this one from which orbital you have to start the distribution of electron from the lower energy on the lower energy orbital yes that's right because in atomic orbital we also did the same thing lower energy orbital gets filled first right by n plus l rule so here also if you want to distribute the electron in this because this is the actual case we have right now if you want to distribute the electron this three orbital will get filled first and then the electron goes into eg orbital so first t2g and eg that's one thing okay very very carefully listen to me now whether this distribution of electron follows hans rule or not that depends upon the nature of the ligand if the ligand is strong then this splitting will be high the difference of energy will be more between the two orbital and if the difference of energy is more then the distribution of electron does not follow hans rule right we'll have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 like that if the ligands is strong energy gap is high if energy gap is more is less then the distribution of electron follows hans rule in that case it will be 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 like that okay so this is the distribution of electron first thing is that right how do we find out the crystal filled splitting energy because obviously the two sets of orbital uh, will have an energy difference between the two sets of orbital so this energy difference also we can calculate by a formula and that formula is called cfse crystal field splitting energy and it is given by minus 0.4 times x plus 0.6 times y delta o again it is o it is not not okay delta o o is stands for octahedral x what is x x is the number of electrons number of electrons point 4 is associated with which orbital point 4 is associated with t2g orbital right t2g point 6 is associated with eg orbital you see this x is the number of electrons present in number of electrons in t2g orbitals y is the number of electrons in eg orbitals okay so distribution of electron if you know you know the xy value that xy value you can substitute here and you can find out cfse in terms of delta o is it clear so So the, uh, we always have zero point six delta O and minus zero point four delta O, right? For 
uh, when it splits? Uh, I didn't get you. Come again. So like, um, uh, we'll always have a uh, zero point six delta O for E G and minus zero point four for T two G, right? Even for, even for uh, square pillar, also it's the same thing. This is the splitting, and all these are experimental. How the you know orbital splits. So, but then yeah. how? Yeah, so but then how do we uh, determine whether the splitting is large or less, even though the fraction is the same? See, uh, when the or see for different see this delta O value, no, it depends upon the complex. It is not fixed oh, for okay. all the complexes. Okay. Okay. So. I, I'll, I'll give you one example if you want. This delta O, I'll, I'll come to this. Okay, just give me some time. I'll come to this. Otherwise, everything will mess yeah. up. Okay. So. So uh, you see here, uh, I was talking about this CFSE. So once you know the number of electrons in the two orbitals, you have the value of X and Y, and then you can find out CFSE in terms of delta O. Delta O for a given complex will have a fixed value. It's not like this value is universal like gravitational constant. Right? Delta O will be differ for will differ for different different you know complex. It has different value for different complex. Okay, it's not constant for all the complex. Okay, yes, but sir. since we do not calculate those values, okay, even you don't have to calculate CFSE normally. Hardly you have to calculate this. That is not required. Even they ask you also this in the option. Also, they'll give delta O only. You just need to know this x and y. That is it. Okay, but for your understanding, I'll discuss one example of this. Okay, so the point is how to distribute the electrons. Like I said, the distribution of electrons. Depends upon whether the ligand is strong or not. Okay, so in case of a strong ligand, the you know the the gap of the energy between the two orbitals, e.g. and t2g, will be more. And in that case, we do not follow Hund's rule when the ligand is strong. When the ligand is weak, we'll follow Hund's rule and we'll distribute the electron as we do in atomic orbital. Okay. So heading you write down here distribution of electron. First one in case of in case of weak ligand. Write down simply. In case of weak ligand, we'll follow Hund's rule. We'll follow Hund's rule. So the distribution will be according to Hund's rule. So first, the electron will go into T2G because it has the lower energy. Then the electron will go into E-G because we are following Hund's rule. Then again, electron will go into T2G, and again the electron will go into E-G. Right? So first three electron will go into T2G orbital. Fourth and fifth electron goes into E-G orbital. Sixth, seventh, and eighth electron goes into T2G orbital. Ninth and tenth electron goes into E-G orbital. Right. So suppose the ligand is weak and we have D5 configuration. Suppose you need to find out CFSE. CFSE for D5 configuration, right? So D5 configuration is still here. What is the x value? Could you tell me? What is the x value? Three. Three. X value is three. Y value is two, right? Yes, sir. So this x and y value you substitute here. Three. Y value is two. You substitute it here. You'll find out CFSC with this formula, and that is minus zero point four times three plus zero point six times two delta O, and this is equals to zero crystal field splitting energy. Is it zero? Yes. Right. CFSC is zero for this. Similarly, for any configuration, you can find out depending upon the ligand, the nature of the ligand. Suppose this D8 configuration we have. 
then the number of the value of x is what the value of x is 6 and y is 2 substitutes x and y here you will get cfs in terms of delta o did you get this all of you yes sir okay. yes sir. yeah fine now when the ligand is strong second case in case of a strong ligand uh the energy gap between the two orbitals eg and t2g will be more and it does it does not follow distribution of electron does not follow hans rule and hence the distribution of electron will be like this we have t2g and then the electron will go into eg so first six electrons will go into t2g orbital 1 2 3 4 5 6 then 7 8 9 10 10 okay so cfse is equals to suppose we have an uh, example cfse for d 8 configuration so for this case x value is 6 and y value is 2 cfse is equals to minus 0.4 times 6 plus 0.6 times 2 delta o so it is minus 1.2 times delta o is the energy here one more thing we have here that we call it as average pairing energy okay note you write down this all these small small informations they have asked question on this that's why i told you in the beginning that in this chapter you will get many different kinds of questions okay that is possible they can frame so all these small small informations are important right like you see average pairing energy because of this only the electron does not follow hans rule over there average pairing energy it is represented by p capital p write down it is the energy required it is the energy required for the pairing of electrons for the pairing of electrons in the same orbital it is the energy required for the pairing of electrons in the same orbital okay so in case of weak ligand what happens the delta o the energy gap that you have between the t2g and eg orbital is lesser than the pairing energy and that's why pairing takes place over there right and follows hans rule but when the ligand is strong when when the ligand is strong the relation is this delta o is greater than p average pairing energy and that's why it does not follow hans rule okay this relation also they have asked many times in the exam So could you explain this again? Sorry. Could you explain this one again? This one. You know, I think it's just a definition. See, when you want to pair up an electron in the same orbital, it's some energy must be required because the electron has to, you know, to be filled into that particular orbital. That energy we call it as average pairing energy for the pairing of electrons. So when this gap, the t two g and e g orbital, if this gap is lesser than this case lesser than the average pairing energy then the pairing takes place and it follows hans rule if this gap is lesser than this energy 
but when the gap is more then the pairing energy is lesser than the gap of the two or two energies orbital like e to g and e g so in that case the pairing of electron is difficult that's why the, the distribution of electron does not follow hans rule so what if more pairing energy is required then okay one second no more pairing energy is not required average pairing energy is fixed for the complex now depending upon the ligand we can have different different delta o the gap of the two orbital if that gap is less than the pairing energy then pairing takes place if that gap is more then the pairing won't takes place okay sir no average energy level is the energy of the orbital average energy of all the orbitals pairing energy is for electrons in the same orbital now one more thing you see the drawback in the previous one is mainly the color we cannot find out for the complex now you see this calculation is difficult and they won't ask you to calculate the uh, the one that we are that i'm going to talk right now you see if you want to find out the energy of the com the color of the complex then this is the because suppose here is the electron right here are the electron one orbital one electron is there two electron is there three electron is there it is present into this orbital then what you do you just you know provide some energy with the help of light on this complex right electrons takes up this energy and converts and jumps to the higher energy level provides energy so that this transition takes place right so this energy we can find out by cfse right and this energy is equals to what you can write delta e is equals to hc by lambda per mole if you do then na you have to multiply here divide here this energy gap is nothing but cfse and that is nothing but cfse is equals to uh, na times hc by lambda all these value you know you can find out the wavelength like which is getting absorbed in this process and that wavelength corresponds to one particular color that will be the color of this the you know the complementary of that color will be the color reflected by the complex so with this method we can find out the color of the complex so that drawback has been resolved but for us we are we cannot find out these values right suppose by any how suppose any means you can find out lambda but how do you memorize that this lambda corresponds to this particular color are you getting my point you cannot memorize wavelength for all the colors no that's why they generally do not ask this question in the exam ha huh. sometimes they have asked in that case you cannot do anything but you have to know that this ion in this oxidation state will show this color that you have to memorize but how to find out the color of the complex method is this did you understand it so the energy difference is the cfse yes so then what is delta not cfse delta o sorry delta o is that only see if i write down cfse so in terms of delta o the total is delta o only you know it is split into this so 0.6 plus 0.4 is delta o only so delta o is this gap and this is equals to like this is a unit it's it's a, you know uh, see i'll take one example uh, this is a second suppose i have a complex uh, this you will understand from this just a second for this complex usually this kind of example is not given in most of the book but i have i have you know taken one example my example for this ti h2o 6 3 plus this is the complex we have for this if you find out delta o that would be equals to the energy e per mole calculation is there so this would be equals to na times hc by lambda so what wavelength it absorbs that we know by the experiment right so when you substitute all the value i am giving you this uh, you know uh, this fact here any value you know 6.022 into 10 to the power 
H value you know 6.6 .6 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule per se joule second. 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second. This divided by the wavelength that this complex uh, absorbs is 20,300 into 10 to the power 2 meter inverse. The you know the value is, and this is the experimental value. Okay, when you solve this, you'll get delta O equals to 241.97 into 103 joule per mole, which is approximately 242 kilojoule per mole. So you see this for this complex, this delta O is nothing but the value of energy, which is this. And that gap is nothing but here. And that is what I am talking about here, you see. Uh, this gap is the energy, right? This energy is delta O. Right, that is the splitting thing we have, delta O, which is equals to HC, any times HC by lambda because per mole calculation we are doing. Did you understand it? So, but CFSE is not delta O, right? Hmm? So, CFSE is not delta O, right? CFSE is the energy associated with the distribution of electron because X and Y values. Oh, at that time I said TFCFSE. No, it's not. It's delta O actually. The energy gap is okay, delta. Sir. CFSE is the energy associated with when you distribute electron in different different orbitals. In that case, there will be some exchange in energy. That is CFSE. Okay, sir. What does that signify? That exchange energy and all. Which one? So that CFSE. CFSE, you see, CFSE formula is what? Minus 0.4 times x plus 0.6 y is equals into delta out, right? X and y yes. is what? X and Y is the number of electrons. So with different value of X and Y, you'll get different value of CFSE. Correct. Okay. So this CFSE is what? CFSE is because you are distributing the electron and when the electron goes from one orbital to another orbital or you put one electron into one orbital, there will be some exchange in energy. Right. That energy signifies by CFSE. Okay, sir. Because X and Y are the number of electrons, right? So the X and Y changes, CFSE also changes. That is associated with the number of electrons present in the orbit. Yes. Okay, so this thing delta O is, you can say it is a type kind of unit for each complex. Okay, delta O, I have given you for one, okay, but it will be different for the other, you know, uh, complex. But you don't have to calculate this. They won't ask you. I have never seen any question in which they ask you to calculate delta. If they ask, they'll ask you to calculate in terms of delta. Only. So you don't have to worry about it. But yes, to understand the concept, you should know this. That like this, we can find out energy, wavelength, and then delta O. Corresponding to that, the complementary color is the color of the process. Clear? Understood? Yes. Fine, we'll take a break now. After the break, we'll, uh, this is actually the major thing we have done. Only two things we have to discuss and this much the distribution of electron and everything we don't have to discuss for a square plane and tetrahedral. Just we need to see how the orbitals splits in the disk complex, in these complexes, square plane and tetrahedral. Which orbitals goes onto the higher energy level and which orbitals comes down to the lower energy level. That only we need to see. That is a diagram we need to understand. First. Nothing much like this distribution of electron and all. This has the same concept. We don't have to do that. They won't ask also. Understood? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Take a break now. We'll resume the session at 6 or 7.10. Okay. 20 minutes. 7.10 will resume. Take a break, guys. <laughs>